This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 33, Eigenvectors and Eigenvalues. Our objectives for this lecture are to determine whether a vector is an eigenvector for a matrix, determine whether a scalar is an eigenvalue for a matrix, and find eigenvectors of a matrix for a given eigenvalue. So here's the definition. Given a square n by n matrix A and a non-zero vector V in Rn, we say that V is an eigenvector for A if AV equals lambda times V for some scalar lambda. And if you're unfamiliar with that symbol, that's the lowercase Greek letter lambda. So in this case, we say that lambda is the eigenvalue corresponding to V. So what we're saying here is that when we multiply our matrix by a vector, what we get is the same result as just multiplying our vector by a scalar. Let's take a look at an example. So here we have a 2 by 2 matrix A and a vector V, and we want to show that V is an eigenvector for A, and we want to find the corresponding eigenvalue. So what we need to do is multiply A times V and see if what we get is a scalar multiple of V. So we multiply AV, doing this in the normal way, going across the rows of our matrix and down the entries of our vector. We get the result 18, 12, which is 3 times the original vector 6, 4. And so that shows that AV equals 3V, which means that V is an eigenvector for A, corresponding to the eigenvalue 3. Here's another example. This time we have a 3 by 3 matrix A and a vector U, and we want to know, is U an eigenvector for A? So again, we multiply A times U. This time we get the result 4, 0, negative 10. That's negative 2 times U. And that shows that yes, u is an eigenvector for a, and the corresponding eigenvalue is negative 2. Let's stick with the same matrix a and look at a different vector this time. So again, we're asking, is v an eigenvector for a? So we multiply a times v and check to see if what we get is a scalar multiple of v. Now this time, what we get is the exact same vector v. So we multiplied a times v and we got v. So does that count? Well, if we think of v as 1 times v, then this fits the definition of eigenvector, and so v is an eigenvector for a corresponding to the eigenvalue 1. One more example with the same matrix a. We have another vector w, and we want to know again, is w an eigenvector for a? So once again, we multiply a times w, but this time we get negative 18, negative 12, 14. And it might not be immediately obvious whether this is a scalar multiple of the vector w. So let's set it equal to lambda times w and see what we get. What do we get for lambda? Well, we get a different value for lambda for each of our entries. In order for this to be an eigenvector, we would have to get the same value of lambda for all three entries of this vector. And so in this case, w is not an eigenvector for a. OK, so now that we understand the definition, why do we care about eigenvectors? Well, one of the applications of eigenvectors is that it makes it easy to repeatedly multiply a square matrix times a vector. In lecture 12, we talked about Markov chains, which are one of many applications where we want to do this, where we wanted to repeatedly multiply our matrix times a vector. And if that vector happens to be an eigenvector, then this is much easier. Rather than having to do all the calculations to repeatedly multiply our matrix, instead we can just raise our eigenvalue lambda to the k power and multiply that by our vector. So computationally, this saves us a lot of time. Let's look at a quick example. So here we have another matrix A and a vector V. And we want to show that v is an eigenvector for a and compute a to the 10th times v. We definitely don't want to have to compute a to the 10th by repeatedly multiplying a by itself 10 times and then multiplying that result by v. So we're going to use the fact that v is an eigenvector. First, let's find the corresponding eigenvalue. We multiply a times v and we get the result 2, 4, 0, which is 2 times v. So that means that v is an eigenvector for a and the corresponding eigenvalue is lambda equals 2. So this means that a to the 10th times v is 2 to the 10th times v. 2 to the 10th is 1024, so all we need to do is multiply v by 1024, and we get the result 1024, 2048, 0. Now one of the things you might have noticed from the definition of eigenvector is that the vector has to be non-zero. So why is that? Well, if v is the zero vector, then a times v will be the zero vector, and lambda times v will be the zero vector, no matter what v is. So if we allowed the zero vector to be an eigenvector, then that would mean that every value would be an eigenvalue, and that's not very interesting. 
So in order to make this definition meaningful, we're going to exclude the zero vector from being able to be an eigenvector. Now, we've understood how to test whether a given vector is an eigenvector. How do we test whether a given value is an eigenvalue? Well, lambda is going to be an eigenvalue for A whenever the equation ax equals lambda x has non-trivial solutions. But we can rewrite this equation and put it into a form that's more like the kinds of equations that we've talked about earlier in this course. So let's take the equation ax equals lambda x and subtract a lambda x from both sides. So we get ax minus lambda x equals the zero vector. Now we might like to try to factor out that vector x on the left-hand side, but we can't do that because lambda is a scalar, whereas a is a matrix, and a minus lambda wouldn't make any sense. We're going to rewrite this as ax minus lambda ix equals zero, where i is the n by n identity matrix. Now a and lambda i are both matrices, so now we can factor out that x, and we get the equation a minus lambda i in parentheses times the vector x equals the zero vector. And that's the equation that we're going to solve to try to figure out whether lambda is an eigenvalue. So let's do an example. Let's show that 7 is an eigenvalue for this 2 by 2 matrix and find the corresponding eigenvectors. So remember that 7 being an eigenvalue for A happens if and only if the equation ax equals 7x has non-trivial solutions. And remember that we're going to rewrite that equation ax equals 7x in the form a minus 7i times x equals the zero vector. That's a homogeneous matrix equation, so we're going to first compute the matrix a minus 7i and then row reduce it. When we do that, we get the matrix 1, negative 2, 0, 0. That gives us the solution x1 equals 2x2, and x2 is free. So that means when we put the solution in parametric form, we can see that the eigenvectors corresponding to this eigenvalue 7 have the form a parameter x2 times the vector 2, 1. So any scalar multiple of the vector 2, 1 will be an eigenvector for this matrix corresponding to the eigenvalue 7. And we can check that. Let's choose the value x2 equals 10. That gives us the vector 20, 10. And you can check that when we multiply a times x, we get the vector 140, 70, which is 7x. So what we've seen is that when we have a given value lambda, the set of all solutions of the equation a minus lambda i times x equals 0 is the null space of the matrix a minus lambda i. And this gives us the set of all eigenvectors corresponding to the value lambda. We call this set the eigenspace of a corresponding to lambda. And this space contains all of those eigenvectors, and again remember that for technical reasons we exclude the zero vector and don't count that as an eigenvector. Now let's talk about some properties of eigenvalues. In lecture 26 we talked about triangular matrices, where all of the non-zero entries are either above or below the main diagonal. And remember that one of the things that we said about triangular matrices is that to compute the determinant of a triangular matrix, all you have to do is multiply together the diagonal entries. So it turns out that the eigenvalues of a triangular matrix are easy to compute. In fact, those eigenvalues are just the diagonal entries of that triangular matrix. Let's illustrate the idea of this proof by looking at a 3 by 3 upper triangular matrix. Remember that lambda is an eigenvalue for A if and only if the equation A minus lambda i times x equals 0 has non-trivial solutions. And that's going to happen if and only if the matrix A minus lambda i is non-invertible, or in other words, singular. So if we look at the matrix a minus lambda i, that looks like this. All we've done is subtracted lambda from the diagonal entries. And so when would this matrix be non-invertible? Well, if we compute the determinant of this matrix, this is still a triangular matrix, and so we would multiply the diagonal entries together. We get a11 minus lambda times a22 minus lambda times a33 minus lambda, and that's going to equal 0 only when one of those three factors is 0. So either when a11 equals lambda, that would be when a11 minus lambda equals 0, or when a22 equals lambda, or when a33 equals lambda. So the only scalars for which this matrix would be non-invertible, the only values for which the equation ax equals lambda x would have non-trivial solutions, are these three values here, the diagonal entries of the original matrix A. So this lets us not only identify eigenvalues of a triangular matrix, this lets us find the corresponding eigenvectors. So let's take a look at this example. So here we have a triangular matrix A, which means we can identify the eigenvalues, in this case negative 2 and 3. So how do we find the corresponding eigenvectors? Well, for each one, we have to find the null space of a minus lambda i. So let's start with lambda equals negative 2. 
So we need to solve the equation a minus negative 2i x equals 0. So we compute the matrix a minus negative 2i. That's just subtracting negative 2 from the diagonal entries. And then we row reduce that matrix. We get the solution here where x1 is free, x2 equals 0, and x3 equals 0. And that means that in parametric form, we can write our solution vectors as x1 times the vector 1, 0, 0. And as we've seen before, this means that a basis for the lambda equals negative 2 eigenspace is the vector 1, 0, 0. We follow a similar process for lambda equals 3. We compute a minus 3i, which again is just going to subtract 3 from the diagonal entries. We row reduce that matrix. We get the solution x1 equals 1 fifth x2. x2 is free, and x3 equals 0. Writing that in parametric form, we get x2 times the vector 1 fifth 1, 0, which means that that vector forms a basis for the lambda equals 3 eigenspace. Now a useful fact about eigenvectors is that eigenvectors for different eigenvalues must be linearly independent. And this theorem says exactly that. So let's suppose that we have eigenvectors v1 through vr corresponding to eigenvalues lambda1 through lambda r. But to prove this, we're going to assume the opposite of what we want, which means that we're going to assume that this set is linearly dependent. Well, then that means that by the characterization of linearly dependent sets that we learned back in lecture 16, one of these vectors must equal a linear combination of the vectors that came before it. Now that might happen a bunch of different times in this set. So let's find the first place where it happens. Let's find the lowest possible subscript of these v's where that vector is a linear combination of the ones that came before it. And that means that those vectors that came before it must be linearly independent. That means that this linear dependence relation didn't happen until we got to v sub p. Okay, so v sub p equals a linear combination of the vectors that came before it, which means vp equals c1 v1 plus c2 v2, all the way up through c p minus 1 v p minus 1, for some scalars c1 through c p minus 1. Now we're going to do a couple different things to that equation. First thing we're going to do is multiply both sides by a. When we do that, on the right-hand side, we can rearrange the scalar and the matrix. So we can rewrite a c1 v1 as c1 a v1. That's the compatibility property that we've used several times. And then we're going to recognize that those vectors are eigenvectors, which means that any time we multiply the matrix times that vector, that's the same as multiplying by the corresponding eigenvalue. Now, the other thing we're going to do to both sides of that equation is we're going to multiply both sides by just lambda p. So we get almost the same equation on both sides, but slight differences that I've highlighted here for you. And now we're going to subtract these two equations. When we do that, on the left-hand side, we get the zero vector. And on the right-hand side, if we group things correctly, we get c1 times parentheses lambda 1 minus lambda p v1 plus and so on all the way up through cp minus 1 times the quantity lambda p minus 1 minus lambda p times v p minus 1. Looks kind of complicated, but what we've seen here is that this is a linear combination of the vectors v1 through v p minus 1. That equals the zero vector. But those vectors were linearly independent, which means that all of those scalars must be zero. So everything that looks like ci times lambda i minus lambda p, that must be zero. But that's a product of two scalars, which means that one of those two scalars has to be zero. Either ci equals zero, or lambda i minus lambda p has to equal zero. But if lambda i minus lambda p is zero, that means lambda i equals lambda p. But remember that these eigenvalues were all different. These were distinct eigenvalues, which means that lambda i doesn't equal lambda p. And that means that ci has to equal zero for all of these i's. Going back to the equation that we were talking about, that means that we can replace all those c's with zeros, which means that vp is the zero vector. But vp is an eigenvector, and eigenvectors are not allowed to be the zero vector. This is our contradiction. So remember that the very first thing that we did is we were really trying to show that these vectors were linearly independent, and instead we assumed that they were linearly dependent. This contradiction shows us that that assumption was wrong, which means that in fact the vectors are actually linearly independent, just like we wanted. Okay, a quick summary here of the types of problems that we've talked about in this lecture. If I give you a matrix and I give you a vector, I can ask you whether that vector is an eigenvector for A. The way that we solve that is we multiply A times V and check to see if what we get is a scalar multiple of V. If it is, then that scalar is the corresponding eigenvalue, and if it's not, then the vector is not an eigenvector. 
I could also give you a matrix A and a value lambda and ask you whether lambda is an eigenvalue of A. The way we do this is we solve the equation A minus lambda I, parentheses, times x equals zero. If that equation has non-trivial solutions, then that value of lambda is an eigenvalue, and those non-trivial solutions are eigenvectors. If the equation a minus lambda i times x equals zero only has the zero solution, then that means that lambda is not an eigenvalue. And then finally, we talked about how we can look at a triangular matrix and identify the eigenvalues just by looking at the diagonal entries and then finding a basis for each eigenspace. But the big gap that we're missing here, the part that we don't know how to solve quite yet, is if I give you a non-triangular matrix, how do we figure out what the eigenvalues actually are? And that's what we're going to learn how to do in the next lecture. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.